Welcome to a special edition of Stagecraft. What is your passion? I'm Janelle Riley. You may know me as a writer for Variety, but what you may not know is that I'm obsessed with The Princess Bride, Pitbull Rescue, and Scrabble. And today I'm here with a man who understands obsession well. He has played the thwarted heir to the throne, Loki, in four previous Marvel movies. His fifth appearance as the God of Mischief premieres in theaters this week when Avengers Infinity War opens. Please welcome Tom Hiddleston. Thank you very much. And I'm what a wonderful introduction. <laughs> I'm so yeah. glad you're here because I'm really worried no one is going to go see Infinity War. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not counting any chickens. Um, I, it sounds odd to mention chickens. I don't think there are any chickens in Infinity War. <laughs> that's the one thing that's not credited yeah, on yeah. the poster. Yeah, there were, no chickens <laughs> were harmed in the making of this movie. Um, yeah, I'm excited about it. I, as I speak to you now, have not seen it yet. Is that so crazy yeah. to me? Yeah, Do you never, wonder who dies? Because I'll tell you. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it's Actually, an Infinity I was, War that goes on for infinity. <laughs> I was going to joke and say, just tell us everything that happens in the movie. But I don't. I, I, I would. I would love to. But the best thing about it is I don't know. You really I don't know. I sincerely don't know. I didn't read a real script. I didn't read a fake script. I didn't see a script. I haven't seen the film. I'm, all I know is the things that I did on the set. And I will keep my mouth <laughs> buttoned and stum. Um But yeah, it's, I'm so excited to watch the film because it feels, it feels kind of unprecedented. That, it does. I can't yeah. remember this yeah. having ever happened. Mm. And it's funny listening to people kind of grumble about how like, well, no one's even seen the movie. And I'm like, we're in the same boat as like Chris Evans. I think that's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. And the rest of the world. We'll all see it at the same time. Stars, they're just like us, literally. <laughs> they are. They really are. <laughs> Let me tell you, they are. <laughs> so I was trying to think of things um, that I associate with you when I think of the things that you're passionate about, and I've already mentioned puns. Yeah, very passionate about them. <laughs> <laughs> but we've also agreed that there's no way I could sit here for an hour and listen to that. <laughs> yes, yes. So the other thing that came to mind is William Shakespeare. Indeed. He, now, uh, close companion. <laughs> now, that might be because I saw you. The first time I saw you was in a production of Coriolanus in 2004 at the Don Mar Warehouse. And just last year, you returned to the stage to play Hamlet. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, under the direction of Kenneth Branagh. Uh-huh. Um, and also, uh, I'll tell you the moment that I think I realized... I mean, I always sort of knew, but when I really knew that you were a lot smarter than me... I'm not, I promise. <laughs> I really am not. Shakespeare is smarter than both of us, I can tell you that for sure. We were talking about, or I was talking about, revenge. Yes. And I quoted, as an example of how I feel about revenge, I quoted Homer Simpson. Yes. And then you quoted Hamlet. Did I? Yes. <laughs> What did I say? Uh, revenge uh, is a fool's errand. It is a fool's errand. Yes. Yeah. yeah and you're absolutely right. Yeah. It's it's does it gets you nothing. Um and Hamlet is really about that. Yeah. And uh and I found it, it I didn't know that. I mean that the interesting thing about playing Hamlet, let's let's just start. Yes, please. Um, is that as an actor, one is so aware of the the size of the play and the significance of the role. It, it, it's sort of it's it's like a silhouette that you, you get to step into, and you're aware of the famous speeches and you're aware of the number of things that were coined in the English language in that play, um, and and then when you when you approach playing it you have to meet the play head on and confront it and then you realize you the story of the play the play itself is such a great thriller and it really is a um it's about revenge a young man grieving for his um departed father is lost lonely isolated um grief stricken probably depressed um intensely alone heartbroken vulnerable and he's visited by his father's ghost who reveals that he didn't die in the orchard he was murdered by his brother the now incumbent king of Denmark uh, Claudius and he is tasked with enacting revenge on his father's behalf and then the whole play is um it's in plot terms, whether Hamlet can find the courage and conviction to do it. Um, 
to bring to to, to be his father's avenger, um, so to speak. So to speak. Uh. Yeah, and uh, and and what happens is it only brings him ruin. It brings ruin to him and to all he, all those he loves, mm-hmm. and so. And in, in a way, it, you know, it, it's genius plot, it, pl- plot um, construction on Shakespeare's part, because he doesn't give Hamlet enough time to think. Hamlet is is kind of hurtling through the play without. He's desperate for the time to think. He keeps questioning, and those soliloquies really are lengthy, um, kind of inquiring. Uh, curious investigative speeches involving the audience saying can I do this Um, in one of the speeches he asked them directly am I a coward who calls me villain Uh, breaks my pate across plucks off my beard and blows it in my face tweaks me by the nose gives me the lie in the throat as deep as the lungs who does me this huh and he's trying to find the courage and conviction to actually do it um and I fa- Kenneth Branagh and I talked about it a lot. You know, you, you sort of you unstitch the play in investigating it before you put it back together. Uh, and it seemed to both of us that there is a, a really salutary lesson in it, which is that actually revenge, an eye for an eye, is, is um, a cul-de-sac. It, it, only, it only makes things worse. And he doesn't it's only later actually in Shakespeare's plays that he starts to examine the nature of forgiveness mm, I think interesting and yeah Leah starts to Leah finally forgives his daughters and Prospero um, forgives and Cymbeline forgives and Imogen is able to forgive Posthumus um, in the you know Othello Othello doesn't get to forgive Iago he's gone and um, and uh, so yeah it's a really interesting the idea of revenge versus forgiveness in Hamlet. Anyway, Hamlet's about lots of things. Hamlet is about um, having played it. And this is actually the first time I've talked about it. I know. I've actually been so curious because for people who don't know, this was a production done by Rada. Yes, so so devised by um, Kenneth Branagh and myself. He and I have long talked about playing, doing the play together. We just didn't know how and where to do it. And we both feel very strongly about, feel very grateful to Rada, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, where he trained, where I trained, and um, wanted to do something um, to support the school and the academy. And also there's a, um, a new campaign called the Attenborough Campaign. And it is essentially, um, it's about equal opportunity and uh, restructuring the existing premises for training um, it's actually a quite a large sum they need to raise in order to, to build the building and we thought we could do this production and Rada would get you know a huge fundraising opportunity but we also would get to go back to school yeah <laughs> and and the academy just generously blew open its doors and we were able to go to voice classes and and um, the man who taught me stage and screen combat Choreographed the fight between Hamlet and Laertes. Wow! And um, some of the company, about maybe sixty to seventy percent of the company, were former Rada students. Lolita Chakrabarti um, played Gertrude. Uh, Caroline Martin played Horatia. Oh, that was the other thing we did. Love her. Yeah, we decided to. Um, there were ten actors, five men, five women, um, completely spread across the board, fifty-fifty. Famously, Shakespeare uh, wrote many, many parts for men and less parts for women. But we were going to have a uh, a completely kind of 50-50 cast. And we made that decision before even interpreting what those decisions might reveal about characters. So Horatio became Horatia and Rosencrantz and Gildenstern became Rosencrantz and Gildenstern. And uh, so you suddenly, what happens is the people who are closest to Hamlet are all women. Oh, wow, yeah. And what that reveals about the part, especially, I think, with Horatia, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and how that reflects and inflects the relationship with Ophelia. Because um, then you start to understand that... um, you start to see that Hamlet is a young student prince who's had lots of different 
complex relationships with women of his own age as opposed to just one in the figure of Ophelia um, but perhaps we'll come back to that I, what I found about Hamlet is and I didn't talk about it before playing the part and there was a reason for it was I, I had an intimation of how confronting and complex the play is mm -hmm. and how much of a and how much of a a spiritual challenge it is to the actor in one way um, it's very confronting because there's almost no character there there is just there are just deep profound examinations of certain themes it's the experience of being alive of sadness of grief of friendship of romantic love of what it means to be a son to have a mother and a father um to have responsibility, to have status. It's an examination of death, and the gravedigger scene is one of the most profound and light-hearted sort of almost presentations of the inevitability of death for all of us. And and he and at that time in the play, Hamlet is coming to an acceptance that you know death comes to us all, and it's profoundly humbling for him because he sees Yorick's. Um, who the, the king's jester's skull, and remembers him well, and and then he wonders if Alexander the Great had come to the same conclusions, and of course that's what happened. And he says, um, um, "To what base uses may, we may return, Horatio? Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander in the dust? Alexander died. Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth to dust." Um, it's almost like there's a refrain in Cymbeline in in another funeral scene. Um, uh, Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task has done, home art gone, and tain thy wages. Um, golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. And there's a kind of resi a beautiful um, meditative resignation that... It, that is this in in, in um, encountering the inevitability of death uh, there's an instigation of life that actually some some relationship with death that is peaceful makes you feel more alive mm -hmm. and there's wisdom in that and just having to just having to play that scene is a privilege because you you have to actually sit in that thinking space you asked me a question. I'll answer it. I've been talking for <laughs> no, a while. No, I'm so curious because yeah. obviously this was your first time back on stage since yes, Coriolanus. Yes, since Coriolanus. Yes, indeed. Um, it's yeah. Rada. It's Kenneth Branagh. You did it in what I believe is a 169 seat theater. Yes. What was um, yeah. the logic behind that, or you wanted to do an intimate production, or you just wanted it to be special? It was. It was. We wanted to do it on site, and that was the largest uh, theater that that they have. Oh, it is. Um, oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. Okay. Um, and but we did reconfigure the seating. So um, normally the Vanbrugh Theatre at Rada in London is a um, is a proscenium arch uh, theatre with a raised. To the lay person, that means. Uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> they're all so, facing. <laughs> yeah, basic stage. Everybody in the well, actors on one side, audience on the other. Um, like a like a conventional idea of a theatre. Mm -hmm. And what we did was, I was very keen to make it... Um, uh, we reconfigured the theatre so it was more like a courtyard. And actually there was a thrust stage. So the stage... We built a part of the stage that went over the, over the first few rows of seats. And then we replaced those seats and put them on the stage. So it was rather like the, the stage was a horseshoe and the audience was sitting in the horseshoe. And they were very close to the action. And I knew that that was going to give us two things. It was going to give me nowhere to hide, <laughs> which I love as yes. an actor. I'm a sucker for punishment. Um, and it was also going to give them nowhere to hide. And they felt, I know because I spoke to people who saw it, they felt like they were uh, immersed in the action. They weren't outside the action watching it. They became a part of it. And also the stage pictures you could make, you start to stretch things onto diagonal onto the diagonal um, sort of more diagonal angle and dimension which means and this is unique to theatre and, and different from cinema is that the audience gets to choose where to look 
So it, with film, the director shows you, the, your, the director is leading you um, and where you want to look. Look at this actor's eyes. Look at this wide shot. This is the perspective I want you to see. Whereas on the theatre, the every individual audience member can choose to listen to the speaker or the listener or the person standing at the back um, and the kind of pictures you can make in a courtyard theatre or more like a horseshoe shape but I think more interesting um, there's only like three rows on each side isn't it it was really three rows in the stalls tight. and then yeah. and then more in the circle um, it was very 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 intimate can you and see people's faces yes. straight, like, I'm not gonna I'm gonna assume nobody was falling asleep but no. that has happened uh, yeah. to me on stage before <laughs> yes, so. yes no no people were definitely awake <laughs> um, especially when the swords are swishing right past them oh my god right the fifth act um, no it, it, honestly it was uh that intimacy was felt like a privilege because again the there's a responsibility on me because of their proximity to be a hundred percent in the moment and as absolutely truthful and committed as I can be there's no winging on a matinee not that I ever do that but um, uh, and and also responsibility on the audience because there was just something very honest about it. Um, I really, in those soliloquies, which I think are some of the most eloquent writing in the English language, was able to simply talk to them and look at them and ask them um, every night. And that I, I, and I genuinely, it sounds probably trite and sentimental and overly poetic, but it's a genuine honour night after night to stare out at a group of faces and ask them to be or not to be that is the question and with my with, with a really simple um, kind of internal curiosity to include them in those investigations do you think it's preferable as it were he didn't write this but you know do you think sitting in row B B seat B20 do you think it's preferable to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them what do you think and there was something really immediate and um, and vital about that which I loved and, and I've what happens is you realise you're in a feedback loop with the audience and they don't know it they don't know that they are giving as much to the occasion as we are as a company um, they don't shout out, do they? Because that, <laughs> exactly. that happens here in Sometimes, America yes, shockingly yeah, a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's really interesting because uh, the more and more, the more often we performed it, the, the simpler the investigation became. Inter so it did change because you performed it for three weeks. Yeah, three and a half in the yeah. end, yes. Yeah. So I can't remember, we did 30 performances, I think. 30 in total, yeah. And for those of you who couldn't get a ticket, he's going to perform a monologue right now. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Which one would you like? Are you serious? No, you probably have them I all memorized. Some, I did some of them. I did some yeah. of To Be or Not To Be just then. Um, well, I'm always curious, too, because that is obviously such an iconic soliloquy for good reason. Do you avoid other people's versions of it? Or? I have seen it many times. Yeah. And, I, you know, you can't avoid you it. You can't. So, you literally yeah, can't. Yeah, so I'd seen... Uh, Wait a second. And your director has played Hamlet. That was, but that was what was so <laughs> great. Listen, I sit before you um, playing Loki for the fifth time, and the reason I played Loki for the first played Loki for the first time is Kenneth Branagh. That's right. He has been uh, more influential and um, sort of into my life than any anyone else in the industry, I think. And he's my friend, and I'm proud to call him such. And uh, and to have him guide me through it was an honor but also he was so respectful of my approach and my mm -hmm. that it was my first time and that even in our mutual collaboration we were making something new and we talked about it extensively like every almost every day or every a couple of days for weeks and weeks and weeks before we started rehearsing and it's like a dream you sort of you you have a you have a container for both for, for your for each of our thoughts about the world at that moment um, and you know there was a we, we there was a Kendrick Lamar track in the production I love um, that and that evolved Kendrick Lamar who just won a Pulitzer Prize yes indeed yeah. yes um, I don't want to say you guys are responsible for that but no, it's no, a no, coincidence no, absolutely not I, it's interesting I just I was listening to him 
uh, on my way back from Ragnarok reshoots, which were just before I started rehearsing. And there's this terrific track, I. Um, and uh, I just was a track that I was particularly like listening to a lot. And then we were in rehearsals thinking about uh, the relationship between Hamlet, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. These two people who he was at, at um, Wittenberg with um, at university. So he's got these two friends. They're not quite as close as Horatia, certainly not as close as Ophelia. And you have to make a choice because you have to quickly establish what this relationship is between Hamlet and his university pals. And we sort of decided that they, that they come paid by Claudius and Gertrude to come to, to Elsinore and cheer up the gloomy Dane. Uh, the other working title for Hamlet, the yeah, gloomy Dane. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, Gildersow came in with a beat, with a literally a, a beats pill um, or a you know portable speaker and playing out out of which was playing Kendrick Lamar's I and they did a little dance and you got the sense of like oh this is what they do at university they go out and they dance together and they're fun and so these two characters actually are liked and they bring him fun but maybe it's not deep friendship maybe it's a sort of slightly more superficial they go out they go dancing they have a good time but they're not as close as his soulmate, mm. Horatia, or something. He does say that to uh, to Horatia at some point. He said, um, uh, what's that line? Um, um, Give me that soul that is not passion slave, and I will wear her in my heart's core, nay, in my heart of hearts, as I do thee. Yeah. There you go, everyone. I just saved you twenty dollars. <laughs> Wasn't that tickets were like ridiculously cheap, weren't they? Tickets were really cheap, yeah. yeah. Um, and they were done through this this fantastic ballot system. Oh, it's fantastic um, for you, but for those of us who couldn't get oh, tickets, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, we, I did feel bad about it. I felt no. I mean, it's it actually literally is the great equalizer. It's kind of brilliant. But now, of course, yeah. everybody wants to know if you might do this show again sometime. It's a good question. I at this time, I have not had a single conversation with Ken about it, and that's God's honest truth. Uh, we did it. It was. It felt like a very fulfilling and meaningful experience for both of us and for all of us. The entire company would share that sentiment. And um, I haven't thought about how to do it again. Um, it's hard because it was so. It was so special, it, it, and and I know the people who got to see it. What they loved about it was the intimacy, and I don't know how. Of course, what you gain on the swing is you lose on the roundabouts. You gain this incredibly intimate experience for me, for for the company, for the audience. But because it's intimate, it means less people can see it. So I don't know how you marry that unless you broadcast it. But the uh, the Vanbrugh didn't, the, the theatre didn't have that facility. And if we had broadcast it, it would have meant taking people out of the seats. So we thought, mm. let's just, it's a theatrical experience. Let's keep it as one. Um, Did it create any problems, though, with, like, your friends and family all jockeying for tickets? We had a dress rehearsal, ah. and all the friends and family came to that one. And I'm not sure it was the best show, actually, by any means. Really? I think I was still kind of... I personally felt like I was still um, swimming in the shallow end, shall we say. Oh, interesting. Yeah. When did you feel like you, I don't want to say connected, but finally fully grasped I was definitely and- connecting, but there's something... I mean, this is a sort of slightly inside baseball thing but there's something about and you'll know this too where the first time I did a run through of Hamlet and we did it on the first on the first Friday so after the first week of rehearsals Ken just said we're going to run it and he took me aside and said you're going to feel insane Um, because you can't believe how much momentum there is in the play it just is just it's like an engine and it's running and you have to be in control of that engine. And the first time you do it, you are, I felt like a headless chicken. I don't know why chickens have become a running theme of this <laughs> podcast, but I did because you're, you're so stunned by how um, quickly speeches follow each other or act, you know, scenes follow each other. You're like, it's this bit. And then it's this bit. Um, and the, um, the part of you as an actor that wants to be in control of what you're doing you know, even if it's just mechanical stuff, entrances and exits, props, um, lighting cues, the 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 kind of technical craft of 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 theatre performance, that takes a while to settle. And then one, once that becomes automatic, 
you start to sort of it's it's very strange it's like the experience of time slowing down and you have more control over because that mechanical technical stuff has become second nature the play starts to settle in your unconscious and you know what's next automatically which means you have more um, time without adding time to go deep into yourself um, and and uh, and experience the intensity of what Hamlet is going through. I mean, Shakespeare obviously isn't easy, uh, but have you ever gone up on your lines or experienced stage fright or even was, after all these years? There was one line in that, in the show. It's one of my. It's one I think the mo- one of the most beautiful speeches in uh, in the play. Where he is asking, but it's before the duel, and he's asking Hamlet is asking Laertes for forgiveness um, for inadvertently killing his father, Polonius, and Laertes, Laertes comes back from France, rightly full of righteous anger, because also his sister has drowned. Yeah, he's having a rough day. He's having a terrible day, <laughs> poor Laertes. Yeah, and 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 Hamlet apologizes and confesses his madness. Um, was Hamlet wrong, Laertes? Never Hamlet. If Hamlet from himself be taken away, and when he's not himself, does wrong, Laertes, Hamlet does his not. Who does it then? His madness. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. And then he says, uh, a bit later in the speech, he says, Sir, in this audience, in front of the court, Sir, in this audience, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous thoughts that I have shot my arrow o'er the house and hurt my brother and it's deeply sincere and uh, I find it very beautiful that he's just apologising he's mm. owning up to it and he's saying I've hurt my brother I love you um, I always have I never meant to hurt you and I know I've done wrong uh, and one night I just my <laughs> my um, articulatory system was is that not a word? quite working articulatory articulatory is a word yeah it really is yeah. cool i uh, told you you were smarter than no, me no 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 <laughs> it's just it's just a, it's just a long word my i got my words in a jumble so we say and i found myself saying so in this audience uh, let my disclaiming from a purposed evil free me so far in your most generous shorts <laughs> and realized I had said I was referring to Laertes immaculately generous shorts <laughs> and I felt the entire company in this very sincere moment start to shake with the giggles <laughs> um, and because it's live you can't go back yeah, um, yeah and Irfan Shamji uh, playing Laertes it was his first job at Arada bless him he just he did, he did an amazing job of keeping a straight face oh that's amazing yeah. who knew Hamlet was a comedy I know <laughs> it's funny though it is funny Hamlet is it, remarkably funny there are some funny. hilarious yeah. lines and not just Rosencrantz and Gildenstern how many times have you seen it can I every once in a while when I give interviews an embarrassing part of my past comes up I was Gildenstern in a ah. college production yes so, so I all know of this it is very pretty familiar. well yeah. I mean I don't want to say I was better than yours but I'm pretty sure the reason that Eleanor we Durant. couldn't fill 169 seats is um, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it yeah. amazing though I'm sorry I'm getting a bit lost talking about it but it's uh isn't it an amazing play? It's the, it was the first Shakespeare I ever saw, and it's yeah. my second favorite. It's my first of, of the tragedies. Yeah. It's my favorite of the tragedies. Yeah. But my favorite favorite is Much Ado About Nothing. Which is beautiful. Yeah. Oh, what's your favorite? I don't know. It's tricky because I feel like I feel like the, in my introduction, um, the introduction to my passion, and this podcast is about passion after all, was Othello. Um, and it was because I was doing the uh, the play for my A level English literature, and at the same time I was doing A level theatre studies. And we were taken to see Sam Mendes' production at the National Theatre. I wonder what happened to him. Um, <laughs> Never heard of him. <laughs> and uh, with David Harewood as a fellow. I saw this production. Yeah, and Simon I Russell Beale as about. Iago. And I I was blown clean away. I just. I understood it. I connected with it. It was it was as alive as any piece of art I'd ever seen, and um, that began a kind of that sort of opened my eyes to what Shakespeare could be. And it suddenly became, and this is so important, I think, for people because at school it seems dusty and stuffy and scary and incomprehensible and over there, and it should, belongs in a library with academics with horn rim spectacles, and it's not for me. And actually, it's not that at all. It's li- it's alive, and it's and it's 
um, vital and it's electrifying and it's present and it's for everyone. And that was the first moment for me that I understood that. I, I was going to ask you if uh, you know your interest in acting came first, your interest in Shakespeare, but you, you knew you wanted to be an actor at a young age. I don't know. I mean, it's tr- when I think of my childhood, I think of I think probably of like many actors of my age, all those sort of era defining films like um the indiana jones movies et um uh, back to the future i totally thought you were going to name like a bunch of ken loach movies right 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 <laughs> no, but as, as in as a child like, yeah, those course. are the movies you yeah. connect to and then you know, jurassic park and they're all directed by spielberg <laughs> it, it seems like um and I don't know if I could locate in that moment. I, I, I'd have to go back in time. I can't go back in time. Mm-hmm. I am not, sadly, Doctor Strange. Um, but I definitely was interested in film. And then... And really it was at school, um, possibly even at doing Shakespeare, that I started to love acting. Um, when I was about 13 or 14, um, we did a production of Time and of Athens. Wait, when you were 13? Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's galling, isn't it? Can I tell you something really cool? Off yeah. topic. Um, my theater company did a production of Time Out of Athens starring John Hamm. Amazing. Before he was John Hamm. Amazing. He was this goofy, amazing, good-looking amazing. guy who uh, wore wife beaters to the theater and was super sweet to everyone. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> By the way, it's a really underappreciated play. It's a fantastic play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I played the old servant. Flavius. Oh no! Did you have to like paint and wrinkles on your face? I did. And do I the had whole... the painted wrinkles, <laughs> I love and, and I had a fake beard. My beard today is real. I can assure you. Um, Thirteen years old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I don't think I did Shakespeare again. I think I performed it until I was at university, um, and I played Romeo. Oh really? Yeah. Yes. Um, and a lot in a, a very. I remember that production very fondly. Um, it was all set in a kind of Fellini style Italy. Oh, cool. Um, lots of color and sort of um, that sort of slightly mad, not mad, but that slightly um, carnival energy that you see in some of those films. Um, I think Romeo, um, people think I'm crazy when I say that. I think Romeo and Juliet are two of the hardest roles uh, in I'm theater. Yeah. Because they're, you, you, especially as I get older, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm like, oh, stop whining. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. I'm always impressed when I see a really great production. I think the best interpretation is, is still the Baz Luhrmann film. Um, I really do. I think it's a, be- I, that was a, that was another eye opener for me. I must have been 15 or 16 when that film came out. And, uh, so to me, when I think of Leonardo DiCaprio, I think I think of Romeo often as part of his like that's kind of part of his um, his persona in my mm-hmm. mind. Yeah. And he is so good at it. So I mean, honestly, it. they yeah. both are. Yeah. Um, so the first time you performed, you know, the words for an audience professionally was it Cymbeline? Uh, yes. That was 2007. 2007. Yes, you're it's been absolutely like 10 years. right. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I loved Cymbeline. It was a uh, Cheek by Jow production. I love just the name of that company. I don't, yeah. I don't know if that is in reference to something. Cheek that by is- Jowl is from a Shakespeare play, and I can't remember. Maybe it's from Twelfth Night. You, um, you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be. It might be from another one. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I'm correct in that presumption. Uh, but, but they have been doing two... Um, uh, partners, director and designer, direct Declan Donnellan and Nick Ormerod have been running Cheek by Jar for over 25 years now, and they start. They've started the careers of many, many um, actors you'd have heard of: Michael Sheen, Adrian Lester, Matthew McFadden. Um, who else? Helen McCrory, I think. Am I right? Um, Saskia Reeves they, they've, they've sort of and they've been doing this a long time and they uh, feel very much like a European company and we rehearse in London and they also have worked they've worked all over the world they've worked in, in, in France with, with French acting companies in Russia with Russian companies and we rehearsed in London and we toured all over the world for five months so we played oh, wow. in in Paris Luxembourg, uh, Brussels, Milan, Bam in New York, Reykjavik, Moscow, 
Madrid, Barcelona, London. I think that's it. Frankfurt, I'm always maybe. curious about how, because Shakespeare seems to, so universal, but did audiences react differently? London were the worst, yeah. What? Wait, London was the worst? <laughs> well, London's, London's sort of, uh, I mean this as a Londoner. Londoners <laughs> are sort of spoilt for choice, so they can, see, they can see Shakespeare every night if they want. Whereas it not, doesn't happen so often that an English company comes to... I don't know, to Madrid in the summer and performs yeah. a, a Shakespeare play. So they are, they're hungry for that. So the, so the London audience we found the coolest. They were, they were appreciative, and I'm being mean about London, but I can because I'm a Londoner. But, um, uh, like, I couldn't say that, but you yeah, get to say that. But definitely, definitely different audiences, for sure. Um, very, very passionate in Spain. Oh, really? I loved doing it in Spain. We did it in, uh, in um, a, a theatre called Teatro Español in Madrid. And because it's a long, hot Spanish summer, it's actually just too hot if you go if the show goes up at seven p.m. So the shows go up at nine, which means you come down at eleven thirty, and we could spill out into the square and have tapas, you know. But that's how they live. That's that sounds the heavenly. It's so so great. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Simon Russell Beale, he's in this movie, Death of Stalin. I don't know if you've yes, seen I it. Yes, I haven't seen it yet. I'm oh, ashamed to goodness. admit. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because I was talking to Armando Iannucci last night, and he was talking about playing it all over the world, and it gets a great response. But like some people are like, this movie is not funny. It's the best really? movie I've ever seen. And then other wow. people like can't stop laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just depends on where you go. Where and you go. I feel like Shakespeare is just so universally revered that he must get respect wherever he goes. But maybe that's not the case. Well, it's something. If you do it in a dusty way, then maybe people find it boring. Mm-hmm. But, but that's been the ed- great education for me is that it isn't. It just is so malleable, and it speaks to every generation in a new way, and it speaks to every moment. Um, and um, I found. Just going back to Hamlet for a second, there is a. We set it in a. is ostensibly a modern dress production. Yes, this one was not stuffy. This was. You did a boy band number. No, no, no. no. I did a, no, that was Cymbeline. I did a that boy band Cymbeline. number. That was Cymbeline. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, Hamlet was modern dress. Oh, Ham- I'm um, sorry, you're talking about yeah. Hamlet. Yeah. And um, the idea was that Hamlet is, is a man who exists right now in, in the world as it is, which is confusing and destabilizing. And um, we, f- I think, the sort of external world feels like it's on shaky ground. And we thought that was good for Hamlet um, to be in a, his own private turmoil, but also in a world that is re- misshapen. Um, and Claudius was, you know, a, a, in the position of of, of political office. Um, and people weren't sure whether to trust him and all that sort of stuff. But but the other thing that's kind of often overlooked in Hamlet is that the political situation is um, the Fortinbras is coming a war is imminent and that is somehow creates an extra pressure from without Hamlet has all these pressures from within his father's ghost his own doubt his own cruelty his Rage and loneliness, but then suddenly the idea that he is a prince of a realm which is under siege from Fortinbras. And just before his banishment to England, there's a speech he gives how all occasions do inform against me. And um, Kenneth Branner had a fantastic idea, which is to, with the sound design, fighter jets flew uh, from the from the back of the theatre essentially over the heads of the audience as if they were flying to a foreign war zone and we turned the volume right up and it was very very loud very intrusive and very disruptive but the, the, that speech is about Hamlet confronting that the world is spinning forward mm-hmm. and the events are continuing to happen and he still hasn't um, avenged his father uh, and he starts asking these profound questions. What is a man if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed? A beast, no more. Uh, sure he that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fuss in us unused. Um, and he says, you know, how stand I then that have a father killed, a mother stained, incitements of my reason and my blood, and let all sleep while to my shame... I see the imminent death of 20,000 men that for a fantasy or trick of fame go to their graves like beds. Um, and 
Sorry, I find myself slipping into just quoting you know, the entire play. Let's just do the whole play. show. We're going to start from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Act okay. one, scene one. Okay. Lights rise on okay. a piano. Yeah. Yes, like, yes we, so that's another thing we did. I sang a song. We decided to cut the first scene, maybe controversial, um, where um, Marcellus and um, Bernardo see the ghost for the first time. Um, and uh, it was Ken's idea because it, I think it's his belief that... Hamlet is first and foremost a play about grief and you find that character in the throes of grief which is as emotionally destabilizing as any human experience that profound sense of loss and not being able to comprehend that that, that, that the person you love is never coming back and um, there's a song that Ophelia sings later in the play um, about her losing her own father and we decided that if Hamlet were singing the same song, it would somehow unite them uh, emotionally. And you'd start to see, oh, maybe, maybe Hamlet and Ophelia's relationship was born out of the fact that she somehow, in out of compassion and empathy, understood his predicament. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, lights up on the piano. Slightly scary. <laughs> Playing the piano and singing at the same time. You have um, a little experience with singing, though. I've done some singing. Yeah. <laughs> I have an album, actually, that you're on. God bless you. Yes, Thanks, it's Janelle. unbelievable. <laughs> um, so after, oh, I should mention that for Cymbeline, you so won the, Lawrence, the yeah. Lawrence Olivier Wool Award for I Best did, Newcomer. I did, yes. Ten years ago, you were a newcomer. I was. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you did Cassio and Othello. That's right, in the same year. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, so, so uh, Cymbeline was January to July, and then we started rehearsing Othello in October. Um and that Were you was... unbearable during this time, just like walking around quoting Shakespeare? No, and... <laughs> not yet. I, um... Did you just say not yet? <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you waited till Hamlet. Yeah, I waited till I was properly unbearable. Um, I think, I think, um, being in Othello was one of the, was one of the happiest times of my life. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't say that about every job. I've, I've had fulfilling Experiences I've had challenging experiences, but I've never been as happy, I think, as I was in that play. And um, which is insane because it's a heavy. I know, I know. And <laughs> actually, I was happy. I was happy playing Hamlet, which is odd, isn't it? I wanted to ask you yeah. that because you like I uh, people I know who have played Hamlet like just carry this grief with them for months. I did. I was aware of the weight, mm. um, but I was more the weight of. Um, um, to me, the profundity of the questions he's asking mm. is, I think, I, and it's taken me a long time and perhaps and perhaps more years on the clock to fully get to grips with it. But but the truth is that l no one has an easy ride through life. And it's really hard. And you never know when you're going to trip up and come, come up against things that you find intellectually, emotionally, or spiritually challenging. And that question... Of, of whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune is is there something very noble about it that actually the answer to that question is to be profoundly to be to be to be to be um, that that's the point and uh, I know it's, it's such a quoted line and it's so famous and it has all this intensity and weight and expectation but to get to ask it that's, I suppose, that's what I carried, is I really wanted to ask it. I wanted to ask the audience every night, what do you think the value of life is? Because I'm here trying to figure it out. And, um, and it's a valuable question to ask, which is why I think everyone should sort of play Hamlet. I think everyone should have the good fortune to ask that question because you, you, you come out of it with this rush of, of life mm -hmm. and vitality as opposed to the sort of more somber... Um, depressive um, the weight of it you actually come out with vitality it, it sends you into the light or towards the light somehow because you have to confront the darkness of it and after Othello you had to take a break from Shakespeare because you became a big huge movie star with Thor which I know I've told you this before but I, I don't know if I've been this blunt, but I think I have. That, like, I was dragged kicking and screaming to see Thor. Yes, you have I, told yes. me that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah. yes, you mentioned it frequently. Yeah. Um, I did not want to see this movie, and I go to see it, and I am blown away, and I'm sobbing, and it's fathers and sons, and I'm like, it's Shakespearean. Mm. Was that part of the appeal of the character? I think so. I think it was, uh, I was, you know, 
Oh, so Othello was um, was one of those plays that was ready to go, and uh, Michael Grandage, who directed it, um, said, "I'm going to ask some friends to come and watch it, if that's all right." Um, the dress rehearsal, and one of those friends was a man called Kenneth Branagh, and that's how I met Ken. It was it was he came really? to see me in Othello, and then he asked me to work with him on a radio play of Cyrano de Bergerac, and then suddenly we were doing Wallander and Ivanov together. And and all th- and through Wallander, really. Um, no, that can't be right. <laughs> Wait, uh, what does Wikipedia say? I'm sort of the t- getting the timings wrong. <laughs> um, I think the fact that um, through that experience of working with him across 2008, you know, you get to know someone's metal and interest in when you work with them. And we were both. He recognised, I think, in me that I was fascinated by Shakespeare. And then once. Um, he had got the the directing gig of Thor. I think he, the thing that had given Marvel such a degree of reassurance was that Ken had such a controlled um, and authoritative handle on how to do it. He said, "Don't be scared of the Rainbow Bridge and this and how to make this real." Mm-hmm. Um, and his interpretation was, "I see this as dynastic drama. It's about kings and princes." It's and, and Shakespeare, of course, was the specialist. You know, mm-hmm. King Lear, um, the the Hollow Crown. We've called it the Hollow Crown, but the whole his first great franchise from Richard II all the way to Henry VI, Part Three, a dynastic drama where responsibility and power is passed down from fathers to sons, and that that responsibility is something that's difficult to handle. It's heavy. It's weighty, and sometimes the inheritors of that power, Prince Hal. And Thor um, <laughs> get it wrong, or and then there are other people around those princes who also want the power, um, which you know Edmund and Lear and uh, and Loki. So it seemed like his interpretation of Asgard was similar. Was he brought with him all his experience of playing these parts? And he played Prince Hal at the Royal Shakespeare Company. He had famously played Henry V in a definitive film and directed it. And so, um, and I think that's really what Thor is. Is it, it? And I think it's been acknowledged is that that his Asgard is very much the kind of has this Shakespearean um, gravitas. To or it. had. <laughs> it's gone now. Well, it's still there. I, I mean, is I, it? <laughs> I think it's definitely still there in, in in the relationship between me and Chris, for sure. By the way, I hope somebody has pointed out to you that. When we finally get to see Loki as, you know, a ruler in part three, like, things seem great. There's peace. He's donated all this time to the arts. <laughs> yes. I mean, like, why were we fighting that. this? Yeah, I know. It was, uh, <laughs> it seemed to be going okay. I mean, obviously, he hadn't spotted that uh, Ragnarok was coming. Yeah, um, who could have known? Yeah. I'll He's not Heimdall, let's face it. He can't see everything. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, no, have I said enough about... But they're all linked. That's what's so remarkable. Yes, yes. Is, is everything, everything, ha- they're all linked together, these experiences. Um, well, Hollow Crown also what, um, it, when, when Shakespeare is done right on camera, mm. it's so amazing, but it is quite often not done right. Why do you think those ones worked so well? Great directors mm. um, uh, who really understood the material. Rupert Gould, Richard Eyre, um, Thea Sharrock. Um, those are the only that was the first set that I was in um, my fir- you know working with Simon Russell Beale is one of the great Shakespeareans alive um, and I've and it's worth like giving a sort of shout out to Simon actually because I feel like unconsciously I have followed him perhaps more than any other actor in the way I approach the speaking of it I was always kind of blown away by how he made it sound like he was making it up right there, right now. Um, and it was it, that this archaic, formal, it's sort of elegiac, lyrical poetry, he made sound like it was colloquial, everyday speech. And that's how it connects. Whatever your version of colloquialism is, that's how it must connect. Um, and so in a way, I think the way I... I don't even think about it. I don't think much about it anymore. But the way I try to speak Shakespeare is, is to try and make it, make it really comprehensible. Um, 
to speak it like you're making it. Of course, you have to heed to the rules of rhythm and verse, but actually try and uh, try and kind of the audience sometimes wake up because they go, "Well, he's just wow. He just that was just it sounds." You're chasing a sense of bit being new minted, I suppose. But then you're always chasing that in acting, the spontaneity of it, the idea that these words have never been thought, never been written down. They're being said here and now. And Even though we know them so well sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I know. And then when the, the more famous they are, the harder it is. <laughs> so um, that was once a great lesson from, from Michael Grandage, actually. Playing Cassio in Othello, that amazing speech about reputation. Reputation, reputation, reputation. I have lost my reputation. I have lost the immortal part of myself and what remains is bestial. My reputation, Iago, my reputation. And I remember auditioning with that scene and I was like, God, this is such a famous line. How do I do it? And, um, and Michael said to me, why do you think Shakespeare has given the word reputation for Cassio to say seven times? It means that every time he says it, he has a new interpretation of what that means, the idea of his reputation, and how devastated he is that he's lost it. So every time you say it, I want to see it mean something new. And I, it completely unlocked the speech for me. Wow. Um, yeah, side note. Do you uh, have a favorite Shakespeare adaptation on screen, not counting your own? Can's much to do, probably. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. probably mine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so weird too because I'm dark and like I like people to die. I like the tra- I mean, wait, what that came out wrong, <laughs> but you know what I mean. I yeah. like the tragedies, and yet there's just something so beautiful, and especially that Very version. Beautiful. They're so sun kissed, yeah. and I want all the costumes, and yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's brilliant. The, the the Peter Brook King Lear with Paul Schofield is That's fantastic. astonishing. Fantastic. Yeah. And yeah. then there's that old Russian Hamlet. I can't remember the name of the director now. Oh, really? Was it done in Russia? Yeah. Wow. And it's it, there's something really simple about black and white, and it is the most kind of... It's an absolutely conventional reading of it. There is a castle of Elsinore in Denmark, and it's medieval in a way, and uh, but it's very profound. The ghost in that is is extraordinary, terrifying. How do you feel about the, uh, for a while there was this uh, wave of like, um, Othello set in high school, or <laughs> um, the, there was a, the Ethan Hawke Hamlet that was like, set the film industry, I think? Was it? I, yeah, I remember yeah. that. I, I, I actually remember liking it. I'm always, I'm a fan of, of, of progressive ideas. I, I think if you, ha- if you have an idea that speaks to you, I think it should, you should have a go at it, you know? Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of there. I mean, some fascinating interpretations of Shakespeare's plays over the years. Um, the uh, Michael Sheen's Hamlet was set in, a, in an asylum. I saw that. Yeah. 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 Um, He's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I'm trying to think of other bit, other interpretations of Hamlet or other plays. I mean, I it's it, I feel like sometimes the interpretations are completely bonkers, but they work. Um, yeah, I got the eye. Um, that's right. We'll just keep going. <laughs> no, no, my fault. Because um, I can. I'm going on for too long, and you should ask. You should speak more. Uh, yeah, no. Everybody's here to hear my voice. Uh, they are. <laughs> um, By actually, my reckoning, <laughs> we have 15 more minutes on this watch. Oh, really? Yeah. The watch. The watch doesn't lie. Yeah. Um, actually, I do want to ask you something, and uh, we'll edit this out if you think this is too cheesy. Did I put it over here? Oh, okay. So it has. It has been said. You know what's coming, don't you? You oh, see what I'm doing? I think I do, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. You can make anything sound amazing. So <laughs> okay. I have, I don't know if people remember dictionaries, <laughs> but more than 200,000 clear, concise definitions. By the way, do you play Scrabble with a dictionary? Very important question. That would be cheating. No, because sometimes, no, you don't have, you don't use a dictionary, but if somebody says, can I put down this? Oh, you check it? And you check it. And then Um, we forfeit points if it's not a word. Yes, if by dictionary you mean um, an online uh, app. I see, I see, I see. I've got an app. I've actually played only Scrabble. Scrabble? I played Scrabble only a week or two ago with a dictionary um, on the table. Yeah. Like one that's old school? Yeah, old school. You know what's funny is most people I play with are British and it throws me off because of the extra U's. Yes, of course. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and course. I have to keep on going like, is that a real or the, word? Or the, is it just you? Is it is you? Well, like honor and yep. rigor and color. color. Yeah, yeah. And I always want to like press the button that says like to argue with but it. But use only but... one point, isn't it? 
as a vowel? I think on words, words with friends, it's two. Is it? Now, proper Scrabble is one. Okay. Yeah, I can bust out the real geekiness. Anyway, um, <laughs> you are welcome to open to any By the way, pages. we are apparently, ostensibly, both as passionate about Scrabble as we are about Shakespeare, <laughs> which is excellent. But obviously, you know more about both. No, I really yes. don't. I must debunk this, this crazy myth. This crazy theory. I don't know much. I don't, really don't know much about Shakespeare. I just love it. Do you know, I'm sure you do, the theory that he didn't write his own plays? I do. Yeah. And, I, and in fact, I loved that play, the, role in the, the film, the I loved it Anonymous, too. Yeah. It, you, okay, I'll tell you something. I saw that play. Uh, th- th- play. I saw that movie the same day I saw another movie that went on to win many Oscars. Ah. And when I coming out of those two films, I was like, I bet on the wrong horse. I thought Anonymous was going to sweep everything. Well, here's a question. Um, it is actually something that I've had to think about because in Jim Jarmusch's Only Love Is Left Alive, never heard of it. <laughs> Jim Jarmusch. Jim is a Marlovian. He thinks that... He, that's why John Hurt plays um, right, Marlowe. Right, that's right. Of course, Kit. As a vampire. Yes, yes. And, and the idea that, that, he, that Marlowe basically wrote all those plays. That's right. How could I totally forget that? And I when literally... my character meets Marlowe in Tangier for the first time, we... I think we quote Hamlet at each other. Yeah. What is this quintessence of dust? That's right. Yeah. I, um... For people who don't know what I look like, well, Google it. Uh, but somebody called me Only Lovers Left Alive the other day because I guess my hair looks like yours. It's your hair. <laughs> Does it really? That's I what mean, they said. No, it's much more lustrous and well, wholesome. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Adam's hair's kind of stringy. Yeah, I guess that's true. But yeah. he is, you know, 2,000 years old. That's right. Um, so I'm going to hand you this dictionary. Okay. Please read any definition you oh my like, goodness. Okay. and we will see. I'm just going to open it at random. We'll put this. We'll put this. Uh, this uh, myth to I the test. I found the word remonstrant. That's what I found. It was literally the first word I saw. Of Re- course, it wouldn't be like rooster. It would be remonstrant. Remonstrant. <laughs> remonstrant. Adjective marked by remonstrance. Expostulatory noun. One who remonstrates. Two remonstrant. A. This is amazing. One of the Dutch Armenians who in 1610 made a formal statement about the grounds of their descent, their descent from strict Calvinism. B, a member of the Protestant denomination that these dissenters founded. Well, that's amazing. I've learned something new. You learned that something new That was fantastic. Every day. Another one? <laughs> um, laryngeal is what we get here. Again, is that a real word? That's I feel like you're word. making things no, up. No, I promise. It's an adjective. Um, laryngeus, larynx, of relating to, affecting, or situated near the larynx. Two, produced in or with the larynx, glottal, a part of the larynx, a laryngeal sound, any of a set of sounds of uncertain character reconstructed from indirect evidence of Proto-Indo-European. I know I'm not your agent yet, but I do think you should do, when they have books on tape, you should read the dictionary. <laughs> It would take a long time. Mm, nah, you can, yeah. you can Read speed through dictionary. it. Um, I would learn so much. It, do love. you know how hard it was to find an actual physical dictionary? So good, though, these words. <laughs> do you want another long word or do you want a short word? I'll try and find a short word. Um, I'm afraid I, I keep seeing all the long ones. Look up Avenge. Here we go. Yes, I know. Way to bring it back. <laughs> Full yeah. circle. Avenge. Um, verb from the Latin vengere vindicare no yes from the Latin vindicare to vindicate to exact revenge or satisfaction for to take vengeance on behalf of avenger noun avengingly and verb Avenge, synonyms, avenge, redress, repay, requite, vindicate. It wouldn't be the same if it was called the redressers, Infinity War. Would it? <laughs> the repayers, the requiters, requiters, Infinity War, coming to a theater near you, April 27. Um, the vindicators, yeah, there you go. Did to you see the Simpsons revengeful. reference recently? They parodied you guys, but it was the assemblers. The assemblers. Yes. Assemble, not in the dictionary, guys. So, if you'd like to use the word redress, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> this is a great game. Um, 
And you bring it full circle to revenge. I do, which yeah. I can't... Um, I don't know if you ever imagined 10 years ago... Like, you probably thought you were done with this character after Avengers. But honestly, and kept bringing you I, back. it has been one of the great unexpected surprises of my life playing this part. And I've loved it. Um, and I, I didn't expect to play it for this long. And um, I, I sort of... I'm so... I feel really honoured to be in it. I really do. Because after Thor The Dark World, you know, the Marvel Universe expanded in new directions with um, The Winter Soldier and Guardians and Doctor Strange, Black Panther, Spider-Man. And um, I wasn't sure if I was ever going to come back. And so I watched, I really watched the movies as a fan. And the... Uh, I particularly those recent films. I, I, th- I thought The Winter Soldier was amazing. I think that um, that is probably the best made. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's terrific. Made. Um and um and then and then Doctor Strange and Black Panther. There's some very profound things in those films. Um you know, that scene between um Benedict and Tilda where where they're sort of letting go and she's teaching him that it's not about him in a way. And then some of the stuff in Black Panther is 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 very progressive and new within the universe itself. And I sit as I have done in recent weeks alongside these extraordinary charismatic actors some of the greatest actors in the world and think how the hell did I get here it's amazing <laughs> really, not truly. only that I mean don't you think you got the best care I mean I know you originally auditioned for Thor aren't you so happy how things turned out yes I am it's funny though because I remember the, there was you know now I've told this story a few times but, but um, the evening that Kenneth Branagh announced he was directing Thor. We were playing Ivanov in London and I ran up to his dressing room in the interval with a water cooler pretending it was the hammer. <laughs> a sincerely bad joke. But he did say to me in the space of that interval, he said, well, you never know, but Loki's the part. Really? And so even in his mind, he said, he said, if I was an actor, the part I want to play is Loki. Wow. Yeah. So already I knew that there was a sort yeah. of seed of intrigue and interest in um in him um fascinating i mean i he is a fascinating contradiction loki to inhabit the archetype of the trickster it's almost like this is my other great passion was my degree i did uh, classics and um i just was a child i loved the mythology i loved the Greco-Roman mythology and the, uh, particularly the stories the, the fantastical stories Odysseus and the Cyclops and gods and monsters and, and um, the Trojan War and, and the idea that the gods would have favourites that they would come down and touch and help and, and uh, Dionysus is, is a fascinating creature who's the, the sort of the Greek trickster he's a disruptor a um, you know someone, someone whose um, job it is to almost his place in the pantheon is to subvert the convention and that's who Loki is is that he's designed to represent the unpredictable the unfamiliar and the chaotic and so to have to inhabit that has been a gift I mean it has just been the, the, the most extraordinary gift um, I feel very lucky yeah and again, I'll take it down to a much baser level and say, as the youngest child in a family, he's obviously my favorite. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And your brother is a pain in the ass sometimes. <laughs> it's siblings, isn't it? I think siblings all over the world can understand what goes on between the two of them. Absolutely. Um, but there's so much love in there, too. That's the thing. You can't, you can't do the sibling rivalry without the sibling mm-hmm. love, mm-hmm. Um, especially now. You know, after Ragnarok, um, it was amazing shooting that scene actually in uh, in Ragnarok with Anthony Hopkins because it, it's finally closed that chapter, and it was a, it felt quite I felt quite emotional because, and I spoke about this with um, Anthony Hopkins. He had learned King Lear, and was about to play it, and it's coming out soon in a filmed production for directed by Richard Eyre. And I had learned Hamlet, and I had watched him. He's, by the way, seek it out, an extraordinary Claudius. Have you seen it? No. Um, with oh, Ni- the old one. Yeah, Nicole Williamson yeah, as like- Hamlet, and, oh, yeah. and Anthony Hopkins as Claudius. Ah, terrifying. Really, truly terrifying. And I had watched him play Claudius, and we were talking about it on set. And then suddenly we were playing the scene where Thor and Loki say goodbye to 
Odin for the last time. And it felt like we were saying goodbye to, to some extent, to, to the journey we started. Mm-hmm. Um, that the center of the Thor universe for the three of us had started as a, as a, a family relationship between the father and, and his two sons. And that was closing, that came to a close. And, um, and it felt very poignant, actually. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Well, I do want to encourage people to see this movie because I'm very concerned they won't make another if you don't go. Um, so it's Infinity War. <laughs> it should be in theaters now. It should be in theaters, um, Thank you yeah. so much for being my inaugural guest. Well, we were here to talk about our passions. Yes. Yeah. Of which there are clearly many and various. Great, you can come back yeah. next week. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's actually our podcast. I don't know if they told you that. Okay, it's so next week mine. we'll talk yeah. about... Not puns. We've <laughs> not ruled puns. that out. We'll talk about... Um, Daniel Day-Lewis. About what? Daniel Day-Lewis. Oh, um, Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. I thought you were talking about like a dinosaur. It came together so fast. Oh, sorry, the sorry. The Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the Daniel that, that, I could, that, yeah, we How much time do you have? I could do that easily. How much time do you have? Um, it's your podcast. Yeah. You're probably needed somewhere, though. I think you have a premiere tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. No, I so appreciate yeah. it. Thank have you. Have a great day. Thanks, Janelle. Thanks. Thanks.